for joining us today. So, um, you know, this last week I've been thinking a lot about the peace of God. You know, we're supposed to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. And sometimes with everything that we're faced with in this world, it can be very hard to do that. So what I want to bring today is just a simple message, but it is such an encouragement. I see so many broken people around us, from little bitty tykes to 100 years old. There's brokenness all around you right now. And um, it reminded me, I know this isn't scripture, I mean this isn't scripture, but it did remind me of this little nursery rhyme of Humpty Dumpty, right? Um, <laughs> what happened to Humpty Dumpty, yeah. right? Humpty Dumpty was broken, right? And all the king's horses and all the king's men, mankind, could not put Humpty together. The best that man could do could not put him together. And that may seem very funny, but it is so true in this hour. Yes. This is so true in this hour. In Psalm 146, and I'll show you that that is actually scriptural, okay? In Psalm 146 and 3, it says, Put not your trust in princes, in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. There is no help. In verse 5, in Psalm 146, it says, Happy, blessed, fortunate, enviable is he who has the God of special revelation, Jacob, for his help, whose hope is in the Lord. And you'll find that also over in Jeremiah 17, okay? But um, I want to take you back to Mark 5 and 26. If you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, it's awesome, whatever. It's between you and God. But I want to talk today about this, this woman who was troubled with the issue of blood for 12 years, right? So what happened? She merely touched the hem of Jesus' garment, right? And she was healed. But what had happened up until this time? 12 years, okay? 12 is the number of governmental perfection, okay? And what had happened, it says in Mark 5 and 26, says that she had endured much suffering. Under the hands of what? Many physicians. And what? She spent all that she had and was no better, but instead grew worse. She grew worse. Humpty Dumpty, right? Nobody could put her back together again. It's the great physician that we look to. This is not to say that you cannot be healed physically by some modern medicine, right? It's not to say that doctors cannot be used of God, but what I'm saying that this woman found no hope in this physicians, okay? She spent everything that she had. There was no hope for her, okay? He is the healer today. He is our redeemer, okay? I want to use very many scriptures today. Why? Because I want you to understand that this is not my word. You cannot trust in my, my words. But when I speak God's word, it's going to go forth and it's going to accomplish that what it was meant to do. I want to take you over to 1 Thessalonians 2 and 13, okay? And this is why I want to use many scriptures today, okay? It says here in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 13, And we also especially thank God continually for this, that when you receive the message of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it. Not as the word of mere men, but as it truly is, the word of God. So that's why I want to use so many scriptures today, because we can trust in the word of God with all of our heart, right? And what is that? What happens whenever we hear the word and we trust in it? It says, which it is effectually at work in you who believe, who believe, exercising its human power in those who adhere to and trust in and rely upon it. So, I pray that you will receive this message today, not as a message of man's words, but God's word. And whenever you believe it and you receive it, that's when his word is going to exercise its superhuman power inside of you because you're believing it. You're receiving it, okay? Luke 8 and 11 says the seed is the word of God. And what, what does a seed, a seed produce? Life. Life. And the word of God produces abundant life. That means it's more than enough today. It's more than enough. We have all rights to hope in him. If anybody can preach a message about hope and peace today, it's me. I'm qualified. Yeah. You know why? Because God has anointed me and pointed me right now. 
for doing this. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. So let's see what is available to us through the Word of God today. Mark 4, 35. Mark 4, 4 35. And I'm just going to keep this short. We're going to have New King James in here, okay? Mark 4, 35 says this. We're starting there. We're going to read all the way through the end of it. It says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, he stood, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, he said, he said, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And what happened? A great windstorm arose. Hello. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. It was already filling. But he, talking about Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. Hmm. So what can we learn from this? Jesus slept during the violent storms, right? In the Amplified Bible, it said that even the waves were like hurricane waves. I mean, this is a huge storm, okay? It is a little ripple on the water, okay? And they awoke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said, to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Woo! <laughs> ah, okay, we are heirs of God. Join heirs with Jesus, right? As he is in this world, so are we. Praise God. Praise God. You agree with that? Yes. Come on. Yes. <laughs> the storms came to Jesus. People don't want to think that Jesus endured much. The storm came to him. But he was our example. And we're to follow in his footsteps. Peace. Be still. Right? That's what he said. In John 14 and 27, okay? In the New King James, it just says this. It's Jesus says this, peace I leave with you. Peace I leave with you. My peace. This is an intimacy he's talking about here. Not the peace of the world like he talks about, but he says it's my peace that I'm leaving to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. There is no fear here. No time to fear. You have a purpose and call to walk out, and there is no time for fear. Give no place to the devil. Let no one steal your peace. You know, God says that, that when we're in the Father's hands, nothing can snatch us out of his hands. Woo! Nothing is nothing in the Greek, I'm telling you there. All right, in John 14, 27, I just want to talk to you just a little bit about the meaning of this word peace that Jesus was talking about. When we go back to the Greek, it's called doing a word study, okay? And this word peace in John 4, 20, 14, 27 is defined as a wholeness. When all essential parts are joined together, it is peace, God's gift of wholeness. This peace is God's gift of wholeness. You know, sometimes in our life, our, our life just se seems like a big puzzle of broken pieces. And this is puzzle. And what are you trying to do? You have this puzzle here, right? And you're like looking at this puzzle and you think, okay, you know when those pieces look so right? And you're like, that goes there. Okay, I know that goes there. And then you try to do this, you know, it goes there. If we will just let him put the pieces together, he will make a masterpiece. He will make a most beautiful puzzle that you have ever seen in your life, okay? He wants wholeness. He wants all those pieces to come together in his perfect peace, praise God. That is what is available to us today. The same peace that Jesus possessed, he gave to us, okay? It is wholeness, all right. Isaiah 53, okay? Don't rob yourself of this peace, okay? Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5 in the Amplified Bible, it's talking about Jesus, okay? It says, surely he has borne our griefs, sicknesses, weaknesses, and distresses, and carried our sorrows and pains of punishment. 
Yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God as if with leprosy. But he was wounded for our transgressions. And he was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. Listen to this. And the chastisement needful to obtain peace, well-being was upon him. And with his stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. So he already paid the price for our peace, not just our healing, our wholeness, the perfectness that he wants us to walk in. You know what? We're to live in peace, not pieces. Okay? We're to live in peace, not pieces. We're not to live in brokenness, okay? Now, if you are not living that life of peace, you're living down here. And he wants you to be up here, where you're seated together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, right? So, let's talk about that today, okay? When Jesus was preparing to leave, over in John 16, 33, if you're following along here, we have got to discipline ourselves, okay? I want to show you, now you know what's available to you, I want to show you how to receive it and how to keep it, okay? Sometimes people get in the Word and they're like, oh, this feels so good. You know, getting in the Word and reading the Word is like soaking in a hot bubble bath, man. It just feels so good. And then you go and open the door and there's the world. It hits you right in the smack in the face, right? What happened to your peace? No, 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 no. He wants you to keep it. He wants you to receive it and keep it and walk in it, right? You're supposed to be this example now, okay? But we must discipline ourselves. He paid the price, but we must discipline ourselves. John 16, 33, okay? He's talking to us today. He said, I have told you these things, though that in me you may have perfect peace. That's his peace. And confidence. In the world, you will have tribulation and trials. He didn't sugarcoat it. He is the author of truth, right? He is the word, right? And distress and frustration. But, what does he tell us? Be of good cheer. Woo! You know how we can do that? By continuing his word. We can be of good cheer. No matter what your circumstance is, you can be of good cheer. Take courage. Be confident. Certain and undaunted. Someone told me the other day about what, I was, what I'm going through and everything. They said, Leah, stop being brave. Stop being brave. You, you don't need to try and be brave right now. I said, oh, no, that's contrary to the word of God. God tells me to be courageous. He tells me to be courageous. If you're going to stand for him, you've got to be courageous, right? If you're going to discipline yourself, you've got to walk in bravery. Praise God. We're to be taking good cheer, excuse me, taking courage, being confident, certain, and undaunted. For what? Jesus has already overcome the world. He has deprived it of its power to harm you. It doesn't matter what you're going through. You have a protection. It's called the Word of God today, praise God. And He has conquered it for you. And that's how you are more than a conqueror today. And you'll find that over in Romans 8 and 37. Okay. His instructions, whenever He tells us to be of good cheer, that is not a suggestion. That's a command. It's not a suggestion. If we want to live this abundant life that he has provided for us, we must do it just like this manual. Everything we buy, right, comes with a manual. Most of them are online. <laughs> but they come with a manual. And if we want to possess his way of doing things in his life, we have to find this here. Okay. All right. Uh, if it were not possible to be in good cheer during the wind and the waves, he would not tell us that. Right? He told us. He already promised us we're going to have tribulation. Okay, now, his covenant and our responsibility. Many people, and I, I went to many different churches ever since I was this tall. However, I don't even know. I'm sure I went to church before I could even walk. So, anyway, but I was raised in church, and many times they'll say, oh, just ask Jesus to come into your heart, and everything's going to be groovy. Everything's going to be groovy. Like, there's not a fight. The fight is against the Word of God. The more of God that you get into your life, the more of a fight that you're going to have the more of a reward that you're going to have too, praise God. You're supposed to fight. Okay, keep going here. 
our discipline. We have to discipline ourselves, okay? First, we must recognize the tactics of the enemy, okay? It says over in 2 Corinthians 2 and 11 that we are not ignorant concerning Satan's devices, okay? So, when something comes, when you have tribulation, distress, and everything like that, you can recognize that that is not of God, okay? Then what are you supposed to do with it, right? It says over in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see if they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world, okay? So we're trying these spirits. God, what is it that I'm facing? And what are you trying to show me right now? Come on. Just like whenever kids, whenever a little kid is growing up and a little kid has endured something, whether it's in school, whether it's a playground or whatever, and they come home and they're telling you, hey, mom, guess what happened today? Why did this happen? And you're like, I'll tell you why that happened. Come on. God wants us to know. He says that we have an unction. 1 John 2 and 27 says we have an unction from the Holy One. And we know all things. And we have no, man, no need that any man can teach us. There are things that the Holy Spirit can tell you that no man, no man can teach you today. Praise God. Praise God. All right. But we have to choose. We have to make a choice when those situations and circumstances arise in our life. Okay? Okay. Uh, there is a lot of mind control in the world. Um, Charlie and I taught years ago at Rivers of Life, and uh, it was a message on mind control. And, you know, some people don't believe that, but whenever you subject yourself to certain things online, you know, TV, whatever the case is, you let those infiltrate your mind. You know what I'm saying? And they affect you. So you have a choice right now whether or not what you're going to do. But whatever you're filling yourself with, it's going to come out. So if you're filling yourself with fears and all this kind of stuff about things that are going on around you, instead of filling yourself with the Word of God, you know, we need more of the faith book and less of Facebook. You know what I'm saying? Amen. I'm serious. Amen. Because in Romans 8, 10 and 17 says faith comes by hearing and what? Hearing by the Word of God. Praise God. All right. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. That sound mind is disciplined mind. We are to, to, to reject anything that is not God's persuasion, okay? And we will know that by and through the Spirit, okay? Remember, God had, we, remember we, must con, we must respond to the God-given ability that we have within us. He wants us to release the peace. Release the peace, okay? It's within you. What did Jesus tell his, his 70 disciples whenever he sent them out? He said, go into this house, go into this house. And he said, speak peace. Well, if he didn't have it, how could he release the peace? How can you release the peace, right? Mm -hmm. Come on. All right. Remember, fear fertilizes an unfruitful crop. That's what the Holy Spirit was showing me the other night. Fear. I mean, the, the, the thorns, the thistles, everything that chokes the word, okay? Fear produces an unfruitful crop. The faith. Faith produces what God wants, the reality that he wants. All right, Romans 15 and 4 says the things that are written before time were written for our learning, right? That's why it's really good to continue in the Word, right? In Job 3.25, what does Job say? The thing that I most greatly fear has what? Come upon me. Come upon me. So whenever you're fearing something, you should not approach anything in fear. Because when you're fearing something, when you're going through something with fear, then that opens up the door for the enemy. That opens up the door. You lose your hedge of protection. We should be faithful in all things. We have no need to fear. All right. Now, the responsibility we have to recognize and reject these things that are not for us, okay? I see so many believers living down here on the lower plane whenever God has this abundant life. And you know, you know, you know kids, let me say this, you know your teenagers, I don't mean to pick on them today, but I was a teenager once, and I walked in rebellion, you know? And now in my older years, I can see, man, the book of Proverbs would have been so good for me <laughs> if I would have just got into the book of Proverbs, right? But you try to tell your kids, you try to say, hey, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. And all the while they're doing their thing, right? That's why God's word tells us to, to acknowledge him in all of our ways. Because we're like, oh, we can do this this way. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. This feels good. No, God's about what is good, okay? So... We, start, we have a responsibility to respond to the ability inside of us and recognize these things for what they are. James 4, 7 says, to submit to God, resist the devil, 
and he will flee, okay? But the thing about it is, are you always submitting yourself to God? Come on. Come on, I'm being real here. Are you submitting everything to him? Are you saying, God, this is my life. I want you to master me. I want you. I want all that you have for me. Colossians 3 and 23, whatever you have for me to do today, God, let me do it heartily unto you and not as unto men, right? Is everything that you're doing giving glory to the Father today? That's how we should live our lives, right? Come on, come on. Submit to God. Resist the devil. When these things happen, resist the devil. I'm not receiving this. This is not of God. I do not feel peace. I'm going to tell you what peace is your compass. If you don't feel something right, that's the Holy Spirit working inside of you. And you need to stop what you're doing right then. I don't care. You know, so many circumstances in life, I have found that the enemy tries to creep in and tries to make you make a sudden decision. Right? And if you don't have peace about it, you stop. No, I'm not doing this. At least take a breather. Come on. Okay? You have all rights to do that. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down of arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. Let this mind, which was once in Christ Jesus, also be in you. You can pray that all day long, but if you are not allowing that to happen, it's not going to happen. Okay? It's not going to happen. You have to allow him to have his way in you. Okay? He is working in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Second, or Philippians 2 and 13. That's why verse 14 would say, do all things without murmuring and complaining. Come on. That's just going to get you more to murmur and complain about. Right? Praise God. All right. First Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. We're talking about things that you can do today. Your weaponry today. 1 Peter 5, verse 7. It says, what are you supposed to do? Cast the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, on Him. Right? And for He cares for you affectionately, and He cares about you watchfully. Be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. Why? For the enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion in fierce hunger, man. He's just waiting to eat you up if you get into fear, right? Seeking someone to seize up and devour. In the verse 9, withstand him. Be firm in faith on it, against his onset, rooted, established, and strong, immovable, and determined. Knowing that the same identical sufferings are appointed to your brotherhood, the whole body of Christians throughout the world. You're not the only one going through something. Hello, just so you know, okay? There's someone that has it worse off than you. And I tell you what, if you can lay aside your own problems and help somebody else, that'll be one of the best things that you can ever do for your life, okay? You don't have, but so many people, I've, I've heard this so many, so many times, oh, you don't know what I'm going through, I'm so oppressed, I just can't, I can't help anybody right now, I'm a mess. That's a lie! Amen. That is a lie. That is a lie from the enemy. He said, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can encourage and support your brethren. You can love on people, okay? Guess what? Just like Jesus, it's not about you, right? It wasn't all about Jesus. Jesus didn't do anything halfway. And he, did, he, was our, he was our example. He didn't call us to live a halfway life. He did it all the way, just like we're supposed to do. But it says in verse 10, And after you have suffered a little while, right, a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts all blessing and favor, who has called you to his own eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself complete and make you what you ought to be. Let him do it. Let him do it. He's going to establish and ground you securely and strengthen and settle you. Oh, thank you, Father God. Be it unto me according to your word. How about Philippians 4, 6? We read this all the time. Oh, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Again, not a suggestion. Not a suggestion. 
This is a command. You want to be a doer of the word of God? You want to walk in blessings? Do not fret. Do not fret. Remember, he's already overcome the world. He is deprived of, of its power over you. No matter if you're being fought physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, or above all, spiritually, he's already fought the battle for you. Praise God. Praise God. All right. It says, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. But what are you supposed to do? In every circumstance, did you hear that? Every circumstance. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you're going through. In every circumstance, because there's nothing too big for God, right? By prayer and petition, definite requests and thanksgiving, what are you supposed to do? Continue to make your requests known to God. Now pay attention here. If we exercise verse 6, we're going to have verse 7. It says in verse 7, And God's peace, His peace, the wholeness, okay, shall be yours. Shall be yours. That tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and being content with its earthly lot, whatever sort that is, that peace which transcends all understanding shall garrison and mount guard over your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And then it says for verse 8, this is how we're to continue to walk in this. For the rest, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence and honorable and seemly, whatever is just and pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there's any virtue and excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, Think and weigh and take account of these things and fix your minds on them. I'm going to tell you what. God's word fits everything in verse 8. That's why it says over in Joshua 1 that if you meditate upon his word day and night, he will make your way prosperous. And you, you will have great success. But I encourage you, if you're dealing with fear right now, you go back and you continue to meditate and on and on and on and exercise Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Okay? You get up every morning and say, God, okay, God, here's my problem. You know this problem, right? So I'm going to present this to you today, and I'm going to be a doer of your word, and I'm not going to be fearful of it. This is yours. And I'm going to pray, and God, this is what I want. This is how actually I've been doing it. I say, God, this is what I want. This is what I want you to do in this situation. But then I go over to Ephesians 3 and 20. Right? Because I know that God says he can do exceedingly and abundantly far above all that we can ask or think. Right? So I say, I'm making my petitions known to you, God. But I'm going to tell you what, God, if this is not what you want, this is my petition, but if you don't want this, you just do exceedingly and abundantly far above all I could ask or think. And I'm good with that. However you want it. However you want it, God. That's good stuff today, right? And I'm fixing my mind state upon him, and then I'm giving him praise. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you've already worked out this situation. I don't care if it's three days. I don't care if it's two weeks. I don't care if it's four months. You continue on, and you continue on. It says the walls of Jericho came down after they were encompassed about for seven days, right? Come on. You, there's some perseverance if you want the things of God. You've got to press in. You can't expect to live a life of complacency and be an abundant life. Oh, you can live a mediocre life, but I want all five crowns. I want all five, five crowns. I want to run that race to obtain that prize. Yes. Praise God. Okay, let's keep going. First John 4 and 18. It says this, there is no fear in love, right? It says perfect love casts out all fear. I remember all my life I've been taught, you know, when I was dealing with fear, dealing with fear, dealing with fear, dealing with fear and people were like, oh, you need to work on your love walk. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But when you're doing everything that you know to do, to, to, to walk out your love walk, and you still got these things from the enemy that are bugging you, you have to understand that it's God's love for you. You have to understand that he cares enough for you. You have to understand that no one is going to snatch you out of his hands. God. And whenever we have that kind of knowledge about his love for us, we will walk in perfect peace. We will walk in perfect peace when we trust him with all of our heart. I don't understand what's going on, but you've got to be brave. You've got to be brave in your walk right now, okay? 
You've got to be brave. You think about Gideon's army. God said, this army is too big. So the first people that he let go, everybody had fear. You can't be a part of God's army if you've got fear. Okay? Why? The, double, the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, right? Go. You're going to retreat on your own, man. Come on. If you signed up for this and you got fear, might as well go home. Come on. Come on. Jesus had no fear. Come on. As he is in this world, so are we. All right. Over and over in God's word, it tells us do not fear. But there's one place it tells us to fear. I want you to take you over to Hebrews 4.1. And I want you to think about this. And if you're dealing with fear, I want you to meditate upon this, okay? Hebrews 4.1 says, Therefore, therefore while the promise of entering his rest still holds and is offered today, let us be afraid to distrust it. Lest any of you should think that he has come too late and has come short of reaching it. So what is this referring to? When we go back to Hebrews 3, it's talking about how the children of Israel were not able to enter into the rest of God because of unbelief. Because of unbelief. So what's he saying here? He said, the only fear that you need to have is if you distrust the word of God. That's the only fear that you need to have is to distrust the word of God. I've been around so many believers a lot of my life, and man, they can tell you everything about what the enemy's doing in their life, but they can't tell you anything about what God's doing in their life. Come on. Come on. We should be more afraid of distrusting the Word of God, of not, of not counting Him worthy. I mean, come on. What did the devil do for you? God gave you His only Son. God created this universe for you. What did the enemy do for you? Come on. Give you a life of hell, that's all he's about. Come on. All right. So the only fear that we should have is to distrust God. It says in Numbers 23 and 19 that God is not a man that he should lie. Right? He's never going to lie. He's never going to lie. Okay? You'll find that also in Titus 1, 2 and Hebrews 6 and 18. But <clears throat> whenever you exercise those things, okay, that causes the God of peace to crush Satan under your feet shortly. Romans 16 and 20. Okay? So that's what it's all about. Charlie and I were ministering back back east one time, and it was so funny because we were there for a four-night meeting. And the very first night of that meeting, I was just like, man, something does not feel right. Something, you know, we drove all this way. I can't remember how many hours it was. It was, it was a long drive, and it was back east. And, um, and I was just like, God, this is just, are we, are, we, are we in the will of God? You know what I mean? You drive all that way, and the very first night, it's like, bam, you know, he wanted us to give up, you know, and I just, I prayed, and I pressed in that night, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I bind in spirits and everything like that, and the very next night, we get ready to go to that meeting, and I go to put my sandal on, it's hot, right, and guess what? I got a bruise on my heel. The God of peace crushed Satan under my feet. I'm telling you what, I have no idea how I got there. It's not normal. I've never had a bruise on my heel. I showed Charlie, I'm like, <laughs> I am not hurt. I don't know what happened, right? It was God giving me a visual. Sometimes we just, I need a visual. I got to know that he's working, right? All right, how about Isaiah 41? I want to read this to you. This just came to me. Isaiah 41, let's go to verse 10. This is God's word to you. He says, fear not. There is nothing to fear, for I am with you. Do not look around you in terror and be dismayed. For I am your God, right? I will strengthen and harden you to difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up and retain you with my victorious right hand of rightness and justice. Come on. I will, I will, I will, I will. What can get better than that? Verse 13 says, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. I am the Lord who says to you, Fear not, for I will help you. How I will help you. He created the universe. Don't you think he can help you? Don't you think he can help you? He made you. Don't you think he can help you? He's the reason you have breath today. Don't you think he can help you? He's helping you even whenever you don't see he's helping you. He's working it out. Praise God. Woo, that's good stuff. How about Hebrews 13? Let's just go there. I'm just 
Shoot from the hip here. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Mm -hmm. It says this, let your character or moral disposition be free from love, money, including greed, avarice, lust, and craving for earthly possessions, right? Right? If you have a renewed mind, you don't have a problem with that stuff. Be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. For he, God himself, God himself, did you hear that? God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you. No way. Right? Nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not, three times there, in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down, or relax my hold upon you. I assuredly not. No way. So, what are we supposed to do? Take comfort, and we're encouraged, and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper, right? Come on, you guys say that today. The Lord is my helper, right? Maybe some of you guys just need to write that down. Say, I'm not going to be afraid. You're my helper today, God. Okay? You're my helper today, right? I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do to me? Praise God. He's your helper. He's your advocate. He's your intercessor today. Praise God. All right, now, the responsibility that we have in our thinking process by renewing our minds. Remember, we're talking about continuing in his peace, right? 2 Corinthians 4 and 18 says, For we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. Because the things which are seen, they are temporal. But the things which are unseen, they are eternal, right? Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We will walk by faith, not by sight, Right? We, we even, we, the Bible says we, the just shall live by faith. Living by faith. Well, you're going to have to continue in his word, right? If you're going to live by faith, right? Because again, Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What is faith? Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Not seen, right? Okay, so what about Romans 8, 24? It says this, for we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? So what are you hoping for today? What are you hoping for today? Are you hoping for things that you see? Most of the most incredible things that we need in our life are not seen. I mean, you can see the manifestation of a healing, but oftentimes we can't see it taking place, right? We can see someone being delivered from the powers of darkness, right? We can see the end result. But we can't really see whenever it's happening, right? Hold on. The Holy Spirit is telling me to go over here. Bear with me. Ecclesiastes. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. It's great. I just got to go with the Holy Spirit. I've got to find this. I've got a lot of markers in my Bible. Bear with me a second here. Because I know that God wants me to read this. Ecclesiastes 11. Okay. I'm going to restore the one here. This is for somebody today. I know this. The Bible says, Cast your bread, Ecclesiastes 11 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven. This is about sowing the word. This is about what giving diligence to make your calling and election sure, okay? Give a portion to seven. Yes, even divide it to eight. For you know not what evil may come upon the earth. You are to redeem the time at hand right now. When God moves upon you right now, don't be starting to think, oh, I'm inadequate. Oh, God, you know what I'm facing right now. Sow the seed. Sow the seed. Let the spirit work on it. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know if you're going to see that person forever the rest of your life. Sow the seed, okay? You do not know. Verse 3 says, If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If a tree falls toward the south or the north in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind and waits for all conditions to be favorable will not sow. Oh God, this is so sad. Look what I'm going through. Let's just have a pity party about me. No, it's not about you. It's about the word of God increasing and prevailing and having free course. It's about souls being saved. 
I'm sorry, it's not about you. It's about bringing glory to God in everything that you do, that he may be glorified in all that you do. So don't wait for these conditions to be favorable, right? The harvest is there. The fields are white. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth the laborers, okay? It says that he will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. It says, as you know not what is the way of the wind or how the spirit comes in the bones of a womb of a pregnant woman, even so you do not know the work of God, right? You know that baby's growing in that belly. You're not seeing it growing. I've been a mama, okay? I know, I can feel that baby, but I don't see that baby growing. I mean, I can see my belly get bigger, but you know what I'm saying. I don't see every inch of the detail, okay? God's working it out. He's working in you. He said that he's going to continue working right up until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's just get there, okay? Let's just get there. So you do not know the work of God who does all. In the morning, sow your seed. In the evening, withhold not your hands, for you do not know which shall prosper, whether this or that, or whether both alike, that they will be good. Oh, I'm believing for a hundredfold crop, right? My fruit shall remain. It will continue to remain, okay? What does it say over in um, Roman, or excuse me, Colossians 3, 1 through 3? It says, if you have been raised with Christ, to a new life, right? 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says we're new creations in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Guess what? The old fearful thoughts are passed away. No, we have nothing but overcoming mentality, right? You've been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead. Aim at and seek rich eternal treasures that are from above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And what are you supposed to do? Set your mind and keep them on, on the things that are above, the higher things, not on the things of the earth. For as far as the world is concerned, you have died, and your new, real life is hidden with Christ in God. Woo! That is good stuff. That is good stuff. Keep your mind on it. Colossians 3, 15 says, And let the peace, soul harmony, which comes from Christ's rule, act as an umpire continually in your heart. Woo! That is some good stuff. Deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise. That way you're not double-minded. No, you're not angry concerning Satan's devices. Whenever situations happen, you say, no, nope, I'm not receiving this. I don't care how long the trial is. Abraham was 25 years, right, waiting for the birth of Isaac. Come on. Come on. The, the man that, gee, that was lame uh, in the book of John, it says that he, he had had that sickness for 38 years. I don't care what you're going through today. I serve a God of miracles. Whether you need something physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, spiritually, whatever. He is the God of the breakthrough. Do not lose hope in him. Praise God. It says in Romans 5.1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Peace! We have his peace, praise God. I rejoice in his peace. I don't think about tomorrow. I don't think about three months. I don't think about six months. I'm about the here and the now because you know what? Jesus can come any second. And that's how I want to live my life. Because whenever he appears, I'm going to be just like him. Woo! Praise God. In Hebrews 10, 35, it says this. Do not cast away your confidence. Your confidence in what? In the word of God. In his faithfulness. Do not cast that away, which has a great reward, okay? For you have need of endurance, so that after, listen to that, after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. He doesn't give you the, he doesn't give you the promise straight up. That would not be a good dad. You'd be a spoiled brat if your daddy gave you everything before you did something for him, right? Come on. Come on. Uh, I am a little spoiled, though, because I'm not so I'm not I just have to say that. All right, Romans 8, 15, it says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received, listen to this, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. He is your daddy. He's going to take care of you like a good daddy. And if all you need to do is just get up on his lap and just sit there and just let him love on you today, 
do it. Just do it. That's how intimate he wants to be with you. Praise God. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we, we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. Right? That's just confirmation you're a child of God, right? That we may be glorified together. Right? Together. Because it says in verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us and conferred upon us. Woo! We have something to look forward to today as children of God, right? There is a purpose. There is something that we're going through. Romans 8 28 says, All things work together for the good to them that are called according to his purpose, right? So it's working together for good. He never promised us that everything was going to be good, right? <laughs> but he's stretching us right now. Why? So we can strengthen and encourage one another. He's allowing us to go through the trials so that we will have this testimony, this overcoming mentality. He wants to show himself strong upon your behalf. He wants you to be more good. He wants you to see that with Christ you can do all things. You can. Don't ever say you can't. I remember whenever I was a little kid, and I'd tell my daddy, I'd say, I can't do that. And he would say, can't, never did nothing, because can't, never tried. He did. He did. But you can do all things. You can endure it. And by and through his word, you can be more than a conqueror, okay? Realize that he is continuing to work in you. Philippians 1.6 says, I am convinced and assured of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ, right up until the time of his return. Developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it into full completion. Okay, he made no mistakes in creating the earth, right? In the universe... He's making no mistakes with you. No mistakes. None. He's bringing it to full completion, okay? All right. It says over in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 24. And may the God of peace. He's called the God of peace for a reason. Sanctify you through and through, separating you from profane things. One of those profane things is a spirit of fear because he's not giving that to you, okay? And making you pure and holy consecrated, even in your thought process, people. He wants to purify your mind by and through his word. And may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved, sound, and complete, and found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Faithful is he who is calling you to himself, right? And utterly trustworthy. And he will also do it. Fulfill his call. You know, it's his call in you, again, not about you. I love you, but it's not about you. It's all about him. It's all about him. Fulfill his call by hallowing and keeping us. Remember, no one can snatch us out of his hand, right? It says in 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning this fiery trial, which is to try you, right? As though some strange thing happened to you. Oh, God, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. What the heck? What in the heck is going on? Oh, he's qualifying you. He's qualifying you. Everything that happens, every time that you overcome, you are qualified. You are qualified. It's like a box and Scott says, okay, yeah, overcame this. Check that box. <laughs> yes. Oh, now that you're now you're qualified to minister to this person. Check that box. Praise yes. God. Oh, let her teach you by his spirit today. Let her teach you. All right. It's not a strange thing that's happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake or you are a partaker of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad and exceeding joy, with exceeding joy, okay? Praise God. 
All right, I want to share just a couple more things here. We have a purpose and call which God has placed us here for. 2 Timothy 1 9 says, For it is He who delivered and saved us and called us with a calling in itself, holy and leading to holiness, to a life of consecration and vocation of holiness. He did it not because of any anything of merit that we have done. Remember, again, all about Him, right? But because of and to further his own purpose and grace, unmerited favor, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. He knew you before you were formed in the others. He was there. He's the constant in your life. People come and go, okay? When you were born, you didn't have children. When you were a little kid, you didn't have children. You didn't have a spouse, right? Then you matured. And you become married, you have kids, right? And then when you grow older, your kids leave, you know what I'm saying? He's the constant in your life. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. He absolutely knows what he's doing. And no one is able to snatch you out of his hand. Praise God. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. He wants you to have joy and peace while you're believing, right? that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's His Spirit working with the Word whenever you continue to feed yourself the Word of God, okay, that's going to accomplish this perfect work in you. It's going to make you a, a more than an overcomer. All right, so I'm going to speak this over you today, and then I'm going to close here. It says in Isaiah 60, it says, Arise. From the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. So I speak that over you today. To arise from the depression and prostration in which these circumstances have kept you. Rise to this new life. Shine and be radiant with the glory of the Lord. For your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon Father, we just thank you so much for your word today, for your exceeding great and precious promises today, Father God. I just ask, Father God, that every bit of this word, every bit of your scriptures, Father God, would just go in and flood our hearts today, Father God, and that it would be a return of a hundredfold in these circumstances, Father God, that you have delivered us from the powers of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of your dear Son, Father God. And I just ask you, Father God, to teach us Teach us about these circumstances that we're going through in the mighty name of Jesus, Father God, and have your way. Let everything we do bring glory to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.